not right, it's not fair. And I imagine that those who are going to speak to us about morals and ethics may address that as well. So the government, as I said, cannot forcefully vaccinate population citizens. But the government can require that people who work for them be vaccinated because they're employees of the government. That's the United States military, the post office, and so many other groups of people fit into those categories. Uh, likewise, with us, they say, hey, look, you want to participate in our Medicare and Medicaid program? Vaccinate your employees. Well, I'm afraid we'd have to close down and might correct me on this if we had to give up all of our Medicare and Medicaid payments. That's what partially runs our organization and so many other organizations. So while the government cannot force us to have a vaccine, it can put us between a rock and a hard place as far as getting the vaccination. So uh, uh, one of the most recent cases, everybody talks about the old case from 1905, which said that mandated vaccinations uh, were legal for the states. That was a state case. State said vaccinate. Uh, some people took it to court. Court said no. That's within the police power of the state to do that. So yes, you must be vaccinated. One of the last cases just happened this past August. Indiana University said, hey, look, you want to study here at IU? You're going to get vaccinated. So a lower, lower federal court citing the Public Health Service Act agreed with the university, finding the act constitutional to prevent the induction, transmission, or spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries or from state to state. Now, of course, that was a lower federal. 22 or more attorney generals, attorneys general from the states have filed actions in the courts. So this is a matter that we have to mark right now as to be determined. Because certainly one of these cases is going to be taken up by the Supreme Court, which is not known necessarily for its speed. So technically they can't make us get vaccinated, but they can do certain things that certainly would encourage us to have the vaccination so we can continue the business that we do. Um, I was just trying to see if there's anything else I need to call your attention. I could talk with you about history all night because it's so important for us to, to know our history so we'll know where we're going. But um, I think it's probably best for me to, at this time, ask if there are any questions. It says, it made it smaller and it says, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, Jay. Um, there was a question about um, the authority of, the, of CMS to do this uh, with FQHCs or healthcare providers, and I think you answered that. I'm looking at the chat right now, and I don't see anything. I can give you a little more perspective quickly on that. Uh, back in the period of the early 60s with integration, the federal government said, follow the Brown versus Board of Education decision that was rendered in 1954. And in 63, the states in the South still had not uh, integrated. Uh, so the federal government said, either you do it or we're going to cut off federal funding which they had the right, the right to do. And there were some of our politicians of that era who said, well, let them cut it off. We'll do it ourselves. Well, that didn't work very much. Uh, teachers still didn't get paid what they, what they should be paid, but, but it worked. And of course, we integrated. Uh, there are a lot of things that happened that might appear to be forced, and sometimes we are forced to do things. Someone somewhere has determined what is in our best interest. And, and I hear so many people say, that's a violation of my rights. Well, other people say, hey, it's a violation of my rights for you not to be vaccinated because you put me in danger. So I imagine that our other panelists will address these issues. But that's where we are with these things. Uh, uh, I, I, I like to 
try to pinpoint when things started changing. I think for me, one of the things that happened that changed was when schools started giving out participation trophies to everybody on the team. And we, we don't teach them that in life, they're winners and losers. And uh, in this situation, what's important for us with Care South is what's in the best interest, first of all, of our patients, and secondly, what's best for our, the members of our staff who expose themselves to a lot of bad things sometimes. So uh, these are questions that I certainly don't have the answer to. I tell people the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. But all we can do is try to do our best to maintain the high level that Care South has always been able to achieve despite what we've been through. We're all still family. And what happened to that old idea that we can have arguments in the family, but by gosh, we're still family. Uh, so there are legitimate questions here. There are le legitimate concerns. But, um, uh, Mr. Hodge. Yes. yes. Hey, it's Dr. Foster. Uh, good morning. Uh, great, or good afternoon, I guess now. I, I do have a quick question on this issue about the federal government cannot have mandates. I'm, I may be overstating what you said, but the fact that um, now at any airport in the United States, there are mandates on what you can and cannot take on a plane. There is mandate basically on how you have to go through a process to be checked before you're on a plane. Is that not a federal mandate that has to that applies to every airport, regardless of where it's located? Well, I don't like the I don't like the word mandate. It might be a rule, and the federal government has rulemaking authority so long as it doesn't infringe on someone's rights. Now, are you saying that you have a right not to wear a mask on the airplane or, or in the airport? No, I'm, I'm talking about, I don't, do I have a right to carry a bottle of water onto a plane? No, I do not. Well, if you tell them it's free medicine, they'll let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get to the point of, and I guess I'll address it later with the, on the ethics side, is that we do have a history of the federal government placing rules. I agree, I don't like man to term mandate either. It rules into place for the purpose of protecting the greater good, the greater population, which means that there will be limits on what you have a right to do or not to do, at least in that setting. Good point. Good point. That's, that's, that's true. <clears throat> and you see, that's the, that's the whole point of all this is, is the, the rights that we have and how far do those rights go. And that's where I think there's a misunderstanding amongst our people because of the <clears throat> educational system or whatever it is where some people believe they have the absolute right to do pretty much anything they want. And of course, the courts took care of that question with that famous opinion from Justice Frankfurter, that's really his name, on the Supreme Court, who said, yes, you have the right to freedom of speech, it's in the Bill of Rights, but you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. So where you have rights, there are also limitations on those rights. That's what hey. I think we really need to get to. Before you finish, let me draw your attention. Uh, there have been a couple of questions in the chat, one about CMS, but I think you've already answered that question. Uh, but the second one is what accountability will CMS or CARE South Carolina have if a person gets vaccinated and then has a vaccine injury due to, the, due to this um, requirement mandate, such as a Guillain-Barre syndrome that they acquire from the vaccination? Uh, that's a kind of a sticky one. What say you? Well, I guess you turn on TV and see who, which lawyers advertise, <laughs> uh, uh, which I think is a terrible way to pick a lawyer, by the way. But uh, I don't know. We we have become such a litigious society that that uh, you would have a, a possible claim. You could file suit and see what happens. But uh, uh, again. The, the balance there is what is in the better good, what is in the, the good for all people. Uh, we all are not entitled to these absolute rights that are written in the Constitution, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, all these other freedoms that, that we have that are very special freedoms, especially compared to most other countries in this world. But we have to realize that these, these freedoms also come with responsibilities and obligations. And I think that's where we find ourselves today. Somewhere it, it got missed. Uh, maybe everybody didn't have a grandmother like mine who 
told me the devil was riding on the left shoulder and the angel was on the right shoulder. And if the devil whispered in this ear, I better listen to what the angel said in the other ear. Uh, I know that sounds very simplistic, but that's just the way it was. That's the way I was raised. I'm sure a lot of you out there who are, are near my age, now I'm, I'm almost 45, uh, we had the same type of, of upbringing. So I think it's a real uh, conundrum that we find ourselves in with what people believe uh, are their absolute rights, even if it's to the detriment of to others. And that's where I yeah. think we need some education. Well, Jay, I know that these are these are pretty hot topic items. There are some questions in the chat, but I we can answer these offline. I have to move to our second presenter because he's got a timeline and he has to catch an airplane. So um, we've kind of gone out of order here a little bit. It's Dr. Thaddeus Bell, who is going to be next talking with us about some of the backgrounds around which he is very familiar. Dr. Bell uh, actually is the founder of an organization called Closing the Gap in Healthcare. He practices as a practicing physician. Um, his accolades are absolutely numerous. I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time in going through them. Let me just say that he has an international, national background. We are extremely privileged to have him present to us today. And um, in the essence of time, I want to turn it over to Dr. Bell. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for uh, having this forum and for inviting me to be uh, a part of it. I certainly uh, did enjoy the first presenter's uh, remarks. Putting things in a historical perspective is always very, very good. Uh, when I looked at the um, title, The Moral Considerations of Vaccinations, um, it caused me to reflect on a lot of things. Uh, before we start talking about the vaccine, let me tell you why we started closing the gap in healthcare, because I think it's very important to the conversation that we are currently having today. Closing the gap in healthcare was started out of an abundance of concern that African Americans and the underserved population had very little accurate information about how to take care of themselves. That was based on my experiences as a medical student, as a resident, uh, as a, an attending physician at the VA hospital, uh, as an associate dean in the College of Medicine at MUSC and eventually director of diversity at MUSC and several other places where I've had the opportunity to practice. I also noticed that South Carolina had the dubious distinction of being very, very high when it came to health disparities. In other words, when the burden of disease seems to be greater in one group of people as opposed to another group of people. There are a lot of reasons why the health disparities exist. We don't have time to go into all of those today. But the one that I felt like I could perhaps do something about was educating people about the myths and untruths that permeated our community that caused a bad outcome. Why do we have so much death from strokes? Why do we have so many heart attacks? Why do we have so much cancer? Why do we have so much kidney disease? Why do we have so much diabetes? Why are African-Americans dying more frequently than white people? Why is our quality of health so much worse than, our, uh, than, than the other citizens of that state? So when I began to look at that, I began to recognize that there were a lot of myths 
and untruths that have permeated our culture, our society, that directly related to that bad outcome. Not to mention racism, poverty, socioeconomics, and a plethora of other conditions that contributed to that issue. So when, the, when I started taking a look uh, at the health disparities, and I recognized that there were about 10 of them, but the ones that I seem to like to talk about more frequently than others as a family doctor, it was diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, obesity, cancer, and then the pandemic hit. And I immediately recognized when the information started coming from China as to who the virus was going to affect, it became very, very clear to me that the African-American population was going to experience a greater burden of disease than any other group of people because we were already experiencing a greater burden of disease of the, of the things that I mentioned. So when the information started coming in, telling us that the virus seemed to put people at risk with diabetes, with uncontrolled blood pressure, with obesity, I said to myself, wow, we're going to be in for a wild ride, to say the least. Not to mention all of the other things that had been going on in our community. Not to mention the political atmosphere that we were enduring. Our relationship with policemen, our relationship with racism and the medical profession owning up to the realization that they were in fact causing some of the issues that we were experiencing. And then the uncertainty and the mistrust that a lot of African-Americans and underserved populations already had with the medical profession, I began to recognize that closing the gap in healthcare which we started 18 years ago, was right on point, was right on point. I must tell you that in the beginning, when all of the information started coming out about the vaccine, I really had to do my homework as an African-American doctor whose practice is 99.9% .9 African-American, I had already began to promote vaccines. This is outside of COVID. I was already promoting getting the flu shot, promoting getting the pneumonia shot, promoting getting the hepatitis shot, promoting getting the shingle shot. And I already was ex experiencing significant resistance from the black community as it related to taking just vaccines in general. I began to find out that because of a number of issues, African-Americans were just not inclined to take vaccines. It took me a long, long time to convince my population of patients just to take the flu vaccine. I must admit that I've had a lot of success in doing that. So when COVID came out, and we began to lose a lot of Black people from COVID because of our pre-existing medical conditions and because of a plethora of other conditions that we were not aware of. In other words, it was difficult for Black folk to do social distancing because lots of us were not in a position to be able to do that. I knew that contact tracing was going to run into issues because Black folk are not accustomed 
to telling folk that kind of information. So just all of the kinds of things that I knew was going to be an issue as a result of spending my entire life taking care of black people, I knew was going to be an issue. And then the vaccine came about. And I'm going to let my, my other colleagues talk to you about the science of the vaccine. But after I did my own research and after looking at what the vaccine has done for the patients in my practice, I began to promote the vaccine. By the way, I must tell you that I've had the vaccine. I got the vaccine early. I got the vaccine back in December when it was still very controversial as to whether or not it was safe or not. But based on my 46 years of medical experience and based on what, what has happened in my practice with my patients and with the people that I've had the opportunity to take care of, the bottom line for me as a, uh, as a doctor who has always looked at disparities and has uh, fully aware of the hesitancy and the resistant issues that Black folk are experiencing, I came to the conclusion that I had to recommend that vaccines to my patients. Now I'm gonna tell you about two uh, very interesting uh, experiences that I had. About four months ago, I had a patient who uh, we'll just call her Mary Jane. Mary Jane is in her 70s. And Mary Jane came in to see me. And the conversation went like this. She came and she said, oh, Dr. Bell, she said, I was praying to Jesus that you wouldn't ask me about this vaccine because Jesus told me not to take it. And so I hope that you don't encourage me to take it even though I trust you, but Jesus has told me not to take it. So I said to her, I also spoke to Jesus and Jesus told me to tell you to take that vaccine. And Jesus also reminded me to remind you that about 25 years ago, when you got very sick, and I recommended that you go in the hospital to save your life. You were not aware of any of the things that we were going to be doing to you, but you trusted me and you're here talking to me today. So I'm going to make arrangements for you to get the vaccine and you're going to do fine. Interestingly enough, I saw her about two hours ago and I told her that I was going to be on this, on this conference, and she just laughed. The point that I'm trying to make is that trust your healthcare professional. If you are seeing someone who's been taking care of you all of this time, why would you not trust them? Why would you not trust them? They are healthcare professionals. They have the background. They understand the science. The African-American community has gotten so much bad information that has been also encouraged by a bad environment in which the information has come out of. So I would encourage you to trust your healthcare professional. The second story I want to tell you, and I'll be brief. About two months ago, the coach, the football coach from Charleston Southern called me and asked me would I come to talk to the football team about taking the vaccine because uh, they did not want to do it. A group of young uh, men, African Americans, as well as white men, as well as men, uh, as well as uh, other racial groups did not want to take it. So he asked me would I come and 
talk to them about taking the vaccine, answer all of their questions. So I listened very carefully to what their concerns were. And they had some legitimate concerns. Don't have time to go into them, but I can tell you that they were legitimate. And I answered all of those questions. And when I left there, I felt like I had not done a good job because I didn't get the kind of feedback that they were going to follow through with what I recommended. But the coach called me the next day and he told me, he said, you know, when you talk to those, uh, to those men and when you told them that of, of the health disparities that already existed in the African-American community and you told them the history of vaccines and black people and you told them what you were seeing as it related to the vaccine and African-Americans, 25 of those young men the next day decided to go get the vaccine. And I can tell you, Dr. Bell, that uh, already about 90% of my football team has gotten the vaccine. The bottom line is this. I think that over the past couple of months, my attitude about convincing people to take the vaccine is a little different. I try to do a little bit more listening and try to understand why people are not taking the vaccine. And I try to address their concerns. I can tell you that I've been pretty successful, not 100% successful, but pretty successful. And so those are my two stories. Um, uh, in Charleston, I'm here in Charleston, South Carolina. We, 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 I'm currently noticing what everybody else is noticing is that folk who don't take the vaccine, and I've had, not had, interestingly enough, not had any of my patients, because 99% of my patients have taken the vaccine. But I've heard where other folk who have not taken the vaccine and got ill and ended up going to the hospital passed away. A lot of young people are not taking the vaccine. That's very, very unfortunate. So I would recommend to you, my final remarks are this. If you're still hesitant about taking the vaccine, please go to someone that you trust. Go to your primary healthcare professional. The data shows that we do a fairly good job in explaining to our patients how to take care of themselves. And so I would end my conversation with that. I'll be more than willing to um, take any questions or any feedback that other folk may want to give to my dialogue. Well, Dr. Bell, I've been monitoring the chat and um, I think we wanna be very mindful of your journey that's ahead of you to the airport. I don't see anything pending right now. Um, there was a question about why Italy had been hit so hard. And I, I, I think we gave some information on that. Italy had, um, although they didn't have the disparity, they had a lot of older folks and, and folks. Do you have any, any comments you'd like to make on, on Italy by any chance? The only thing that I would know about Italy is that they experienced a very serious surge and they lost a lot of people. Uh, the Delta variant hit Italy pretty hard. Um, they have had some success uh, in vaccinating people. Uh, the other thing that I would remind folks is that when you look at almost 800,000 people losing their lives from this uh, Delta variant and almost 5 million people dying. And we've been able to use a vaccine that has certainly curbed those numbers significantly to the point where uh, I'm going to be able to go to Atlanta and spend some time with my grandson, who is 11, who's had the vaccine, and my daughter and her husband and myself, we are going to be able to be around one another. And it's all because we took the vaccine. So um, I would say 
uh, the proof is in the pudding. Um, I can still understand folk who are hesitant uh, about it, but I would say to those people, make sure that you talk to someone that you trust. Do not depend on social media or talking to other folk who don't know what they're talking about. Talk to people that you trust and take the vaccine. <laughs> Good closing remarks. And um, by the way, you've gotten a, a shout out from uh, one of our dentists, Dr. Bell. She says, I received your scholarship while in dental school. That's Dr. Brandy Hare. So, oh, thank you uh, very much. So, safe travels. Thank you so much. Uh, we so appreciate. Thank um, you very much for having me today. Thank you. I'm going to switch us over now to Dr. Rick Foster. Um, Dr. Rick Foster is joining us and has really a wonderful background. Um, he's had a lot of areas that he served as senior physician advisor to so many multiple entities, DHHS, DHEC, uh, specifically around the uh, pandemic related ethics as we were considering therapeutics and so forth. Um, so in the considerations of time, I'm going to defer to Dr. Foster. He was going to be talking about ethical considerations. Thank you, Dr. Foster. Thank you so much, Ann. And uh, I'm so glad to follow um, Dr. Bell. I'm, I'm so glad his last comments were very much focused on the importance of trust. And you'll see that in just a few minutes from, from a uh, healthcare and, and bioethics standpoint. Uh, I do want to start out, though, um, by adding my deep appreciation and admiration to all of you that are on here that are part of the Care South team for your courage and your dedication, um, your selflessness uh, in serving others, um, putting yourselves in harm's way um, to help improve the health and well-being of all that you care for, including the amazing work that y'all have done during this pandemic. I'm most familiar with the um, wonderful effort that y'all have made as far as giving access to monoclonal antibodies to patients who have been exposed and are symptomatic with COVID. Uh, you have been one of the real leaders in that area, but I also know that you've done wonderful work as far as providing access to testing uh, and vaccinations, especially to vulnerable communities and populations that may be at most risk. And you've been a real model for that. I'm very proud to say that I serve on the board of Federal Healthcare, your sister community health center network in the Charleston area, and it's been one of the most rewarding experiences. I'll also say that I've been working in the South healthcare system for over 45 years at all levels. I started as an orderly in my hometown hospital, uh, and I've been fortunate to be able to um, be involved with um, bioethics or healthcare ethics for a number of years, as well as being very much involved at the state level. Uh, and it relates to improving community health and addressing health from a equity and, and social justice standpoint. So I have those perspectives. I also want to let you know as I go through, and I'm going to try to be fairly quick because I want to give plenty of time for Dr. Kelly. Uh, I do have slides and I'm going to make some comments that, that, I, that I realize may make people uncomfortable um, or may in some respects um, offend you in any way. It's not my intent. Uh, what I'm trying to do is is look at this pandemic, as it says in the title here, from an ethical perspective and look at the ethical principles and expectations and values that we have established as a country uh, very clearly. Some of it is driven by um, what happened in the research world earlier in the 20th century that created justified distrust uh, in the healthcare system. Um, but I think it's important to look at this pandemic from an ethics perspective. Next slide. So Potter Stewart was uh, actually a Supreme Court justice during the civil rights movement and was uh, a stalwart as far as it related to uh, looking at issues around ethics, uh, as well as um, being a very strong force with the Supreme Court around the time of the civil rights movement. And as you see here, I think this is an important way to frame my comments. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do and what is right to do. So I'm, it's kind of a variation on what Mr. Hodge was saying. We have a right to do many things in this country. We're very blessed to be Americans and to have the level of freedom that we have um, that began when this country was formed. Although there were discriminations from the, the day this country was formed as well, and people didn't have uh, equal rights as such. Um, and that's maybe for a separate talk a different day. But there is a difference between what you have the right to do and what is right to do. And this is where you get into the issue of 
uh, liberties and autonomy are not absolute. And that it has to be balanced by the fact that there are going to be situations like we've seen, unfortunately, in this pandemic, where you have to look at the greater good. And if, if your right to do something results in harm to others, then that's the limit um, to that, what you have the right to do. Next slide. And I want to start out with, with um, what I call the, the, the seven core ethical principles. I'm not going to have time to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to emphasize, and you'll have these slides afterwards, these are not independent principles. They are interconnected. So the first two are fancy ways of saying um, acting for the benefit of others and obligation not to inflict harm, but the two sides of the coin of beneficence and non-maleficence. And so if you look at even the, the whole initial effort around vaccination, when the COVID vaccination program started, the goal was to get the vaccine to as many people as possible. And the phrase was be fair and equitable. Unfortunately, as you'll see in a few minutes, um, if you're focused only on benefiting the most people sometimes, um, it may or may not be fair, equitable, and just. Um, but the obligation to act on the benefit has to be balanced with the fact that you need to be obligated not to inflict harm on others. And so if there are people or populations, for instance, that don't have that same access to vaccinations or to testing or to other services, then there's a potential for harm. I think you also need to look at this because we're talking today about these vaccine requirements and, and uh, what are termed as vaccine mandates. Um, we as healthcare professionals do have an obligation, it's core to who we are, um, not to inflict harm on others. Uh, and the reality is um, if you're not vaccinated, uh, and you're working with patients and populations that are at highest risk, um, there is a greater risk of exposure from that standpoint to you both yourself and potentially harm to others in your own family, but also to the patients that you serve. The next one, which has been the most challenging one, is autonomy, this obligation to respect the freedoms and independent decision-making rights of the individual. And that is critically important and is core uh, to healthcare or bioethics, that we need to respect the wishes of a person. Um, this has obviously come up most uh, through healthcare as it relates to end of life care uh, and end of life care decisions. But in this case, this is the challenge where autonomy uh, does have its limits. We need to respect freedoms and independent decision making as long as uh, it is not creating much greater risk to others, uh, both in other individuals as well as to the greater population. The next one, justice, is the one that probably has is, is, is been the most difficult to achieve from an ethics standpoint. Uh, and you'll hear in a minute that we've actually established a pandemic ethics advisory council early in this pandemic here in South Carolina. And we spent a lot of time talking about this interface between ethics and equity. And the fact that we've not always done a very good job in the bioethical world of understanding um, our ethical principles in the context of equity and justice. But it's an obligation to equitably distribute benefits, risk, cost, and resources. This is a place where uh, Care South and FEDER and other community health centers have actually been a model for justice and the fact that without your programs and your efforts, um, we would not have been able to close what initially was a huge gap uh, in vaccination rates for people in communities of color and those in more vulnerable settings. The next one, transparency, is still a challenge. There is an obligation to be open and honest with the communication. I think what Dr. Bell talked about as far as going to Charleston Southern and talking to the athletes and listening to their concerns, what were many legitimate concerns, and trying to answer their concerns, but also present what knowledge he had about the safety and efficacy of the vaccines that were available is a wonderful example of being very transparent and providing information. And while I know there are concerns, including for some of you on this call today, of whether the vaccines really are safe and really how effective they are, um, I believe that this is one of the times when actually the process has been very transparent. The level of information that is readily available uh, on these vaccines and the vaccination process uh, is unprecedented in many ways. I wish we had that level of transparency uh, with other treatments um, and medications. The trustworthiness is kind of ties back to what Dr. Bell had talked about, to take actions and make decisions in an honest, reliable, and respectful manner. So this is one where there has to be the trust of those you serve, the patients and populations you serve, and they have to know that you're going to take actions and make recommendations that is honest and reliable uh, and is respectful of their concerns, but also they can trust that you're making the best recommendations um, as an expert 
as someone who should have the knowledge and understanding of what evidence is available. And then finally, proportionality is demanding that in weighing and balancing individual freedoms against wider social goods, that the considerations will be made in a proportionate way. So we still need to consider um, the freedoms of individuals, but it has to be proportionate to what steps we need to take to protect um, specific populations, uh, specific communities, and make sure that that is done in an equitable and just manner. Next slide. With that said, this is a very busy side, and I'm not going to have time to get into detail, but I think you need to understand that there are two major ethical theories um, that, are, that exist in, in the healthcare and, public, and, and health uh, uh, world. Um, the first one is the one to me that's more ideal. This is what we call acts based it's, the, it's deontology ethics, where a person or entity will follow his, her, their obligations to another individual or society because of upholding one's duty is what is considered ethically correct. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all looked at ethics from this standpoint and made our decisions and said, especially for healthcare workers and first responders, due to our duty to serve obligation, that we'd all get vaccinated. We wouldn't need to be told that we need to be vaccinated so we protect those we serve. That would be a form of an acts-based approach or an obligation of an organization to create a safe working environment and protect its workforce and customers. I would make the argument that uh, early on health systems were challenged with this, uh, got much better. I think the fact that schools in our state uh, were not allowed to make their own decisions um, as it relates to masking and distancing took away their ability to have acts-based obligation to make a decision on what would be the safest environment for both their workforce, and in this case, their customers were the children, who some did get sick, who some did die, uh, and probably many of those could have been prevented if we'd have been able to allow that level of acts-based ethics. And then the individual responsibility to protect others by mask wearing, physical distancing, and being fully vaccinated. I will say I'll continue to be amazed that I, and I've been, like I said, working in the healthcare system for over 45 years in this state. I've never seen uh, the number of people that I respect and are very intelligent people that don't seem to understand that mask wearing is not just to protect yourself. The physical distancing is not just to protect yourself or the vaccination at the end of the day is also to protect others. And then balanced against this is the one we're challenged with right now is the utilitarian ethics, which is rules-based. And so that the choice yields the greatest benefit to the most people is the one that is ethically correct. And this is where you see requirements for proper masking and vaccine mandates, uh, urban focused vaccine allocations and first come first serve that was done initially with the vaccination was rules based because the goal was first and foremost to get the vaccine to the most people as quickly as possible. And then how re schools and key businesses reopen can be rules based as we've seen in both directions. States that have allowed for um, mask requirements and distancing versus those states have not have seen huge differences in the number of children and adolescents being affected, the number of teachers becoming sick, the number of disruptions in the school process. So we have real world evidence of this challenge in the balancing act between these two approaches to ethics. Next slide. With that said, there are three basic ethical duties of healthcare leaders. And I thought it was important to kind of um, close this part of my presentation uh, with this. There is the duty to plan, and that's where we're managing uncertainty and foreseeable ethical challenges in a public health emergency. To be very honestly, at all levels of our world, uh, but definitely at our state and national level, we have done a very poor job up until more recently in planning. There was not proper planning for this type of a public health crisis. There were plenty of, of experts um, in, in, the, in the emergency preparedness world, in the epidemiology world, that knew that we needed to have more planning. It did not exist. Um, and so that moved us into uh, some really difficult situ situations. The other two quickly are duty to guide, responsibility and lead and direct others based on evidence and empathy. This is where we know from previous work with vaccinations, the most reliable way to maximize vaccinations and reduce hesitancy and resistance is to have your primary care provider recommending it. To me, that's a duty to guide. The responsibility that you have to lead and direct others based on both evidence and empathy, and then duty to safeguard. This is, again, the idea of both supporting the healthcare workers, but also protecting vulnerable populations. So these are all three ethical duties that come into play with what we're dealing with right now and the latest efforts as far as trying to further curb 
the negative impact on our society from this pandemic. Next slide. And I realize my, my time is going to be limited. I just want to say that the greatest challenge we now face with this pandemic, I believe, and this is looking at it from an ethics perspective, is not the virus itself, but rather human behavior at both an individual and collective level. We have never seen this kind of social discord that actually predated the pandemic. And it has just heightened the challenges that we're seeing um, with this, um, this pandemic. Um, the conflicts, we should be focused fully on the vaccine as the enemy, as the adversary. And to be honest with you, we've made it easy for the Delta variant to come along and take hold because we were spending so much time and energy fighting each other. And we are not the enemy. Uh, we should be aligned in our efforts uh, to minimize the harm caused by this type of a viral pandemic. Next slide. And again, I'm realizing time. I'm, I'm just gonna let you know, and you can read, read these afterwards. This is my perspective uh, from an ethics standpoint on our pandemic response to date. Uh, the level of political, political allegiance, I mean, that's just the reality in social ideology, um, sometimes weighing over public health and safety, even when we've known there are steps that could be taken from a public health and public safety standpoint. We have not been able to do it sometimes in this state and across this nation because of a level of political and, and uh, allegiance and ideology that we've not seen, I think, ever before. The issue of autonomy and rights of the one prevailing over the needs of the many and understanding that there are limits to autonomy and individual liberty, um, that health inequities and social injustices have been amplified as Dr. Bell had talked about, uh, is put a spotlight. My hope is we will learn from the spotlight uh, that's been placed on, on those inequities and injustices and finally deal with the profound systemic racism that still exists. The false choices that have been made between public health and economic and edu education stability that have been created by state and national leaders. Like I said, there was a better way for us to reopen schools in, uh, in the beginning of the fall, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, and I think we would have had much more disruption of classes and much less harm to children, adolescents, and um, those who work in that setting. And pregnant moms, unfortunately. That's one that's a whole other talk in itself. And you see the other two. But it, ultimately, we need a higher level of collaboration and shared accountability. Next slide. So the first step in the evolution of ethics is a sense of solidarity with other human beings. I'm actually going to quickly go through these, realizing that my time is almost up. Uh, next slide. So back in April of last year, a diverse panel of healthcare professionals, ethicists, sociologists, health economists, chaplains, and health lawyers came together under the auspices of SCMA, SCHA, and DHEC. We established this Pandemic Ethics Advisory Council that continues to meet to this day. Um, and we focus on pandemic ethics-based communication education and coming up with uh, ethics-based guidance related to our response to the pandemic. Uh, it was a precursor to the COVID Clinical Treatment Advisory Panel that has provided guidance for both the inpatient remdesivir program and more recently with the monoclonal antibody treatment program. And like I said, we're presently meeting on a monthly basis and hopefully we'll be able to help with establishing better um, plans for future because this won't be the last pandemic our world and our country sees. Next slide. Our vision, every person in South Carolina is treated with dignity, respect and fairness during the pandemic and to establish ethics-based guidance and resources to a broad range of audiences. Next slide. Uh, and these are just the values that guided our efforts, that a fundamental ethical commitment to response is accountable, transparent, and worthy of trust. So you'll see how it ties back to the principles that promote solidarity and mutual responsibility. We're being accountable to each other and trying to have a clear and consistent message. The need to res be respectful, fair, effective, and efficient, protecting those populations most at risk by reducing mortality and serious morbidity respecting individuals and groups and striving for fairness and protecting against systemic unfairness and inequity. Those were our guiding values from our work with that, that council. Next slide. And here are my recommended solutions as we close my part today. Uh, we do need going forward to clearly establish public health safety and protection as our core ethical value in the face of a pandemic. I spent a number of years working at the Hospital Association leading a statewide program around quality and patient safety. And one of the things we worked very diligently with was to convince hospital and hospital leaders and boards that, public, that patient safety was the core value of their organization, not just one of their values or their strategic missions, it was core. 
And until we realize that when we have a true pandemic or some other true public health emergency, that we have to have public health safety and protection is first and foremost. Uh, that we need to consistently enforce public health mandates or reg requirements, whatever term you want to use, when it is apparent that unchecked autonomy is creating major societal harm. That's where we are right now. We still have too many people that are not vaccinated, including healthcare workers. Um, if we had seen, I think, more progress there, this probably could have been addressed differently. That we need to ensure ethically and clinically sound school and business reopenings are in place and are focused to maximize public safety. This does not have to be an either or choice. We made it an either or choice, unfortunately, in this state and in many states. Demanding a proportional allocation of benefits and resources. This is very relevant to community health centers um, and making sure that the understanding is that community health centers are vital. Um, definitely have been vital during the pandemic and going forward will be, continue to be extremely vital and need to have the ability to have proportional allocation of benefits and resources. And then effectively obtain and utilize equity stratified data to guide decision making and ensure a more balanced approach to benefit, producing benefit and reducing harm. And I think I do have one last, I always like to end with a quote. Um, and this one is one of the greatest scientific minds of all time, Albert Einstein, who spent a lot of time and energy looking at human behavior. And I think this is an important one for me to leave you with as, as you we go to Dr. Kelly. The most important human endeavor is the striving for morality in our actions. Our inner balance and even our very existence depend on it. Only morality in our actions can give beauty and dignity to life. And that's what I'm hoping for all of us as we go forward. I know there will be many challenges. This pandemic is not over. But if we look with e at each other and how we interact with each other and make decisions from a moral and ethical standpoint, we're in a much better position uh, to make the right types of decisions and do the right thing. Thank you so much for the time today. Thank you, Dr. Foster. That, was, that last quote was absolutely beautiful. Um, we've had a few questions in the chat. Uh, I think some of them are, are of a data-based area, but, uh, and Dr. Kelly has said that she'll be answering those. Um, <clears throat> I think this last one that came up, yes, the unvaxxed are afraid, and we are being made to feel as if we are uneducated and unethical. There are some of us who have conformed because we have families to feed. Most of the data is constantly changing, contradictory, and hard to keep up with. Um, and they, they express feelings of not being heard. I, I think that's an excellent point. And I think that's why um, the way Dr. Bell talked about how he tried to address um, his discussion with the, the football team and even felt like he could have done more. We need to, be, um, to, to have both the evidence, but also present it with empathy. And so my view is that we need to, to listen uh, to any concern people have about why they're choosing not to be vaccinated and differentiate between concerns that we may be able to address by saying that's not correct information. Let me explain to you what information we do have versus other factors that may be causing concern. So I realize that, that it, it, and because we're in such a contentious environment, and I, and I appreciate the concern that we cannot respond by saying, well, here's what the information shows us, and here what the ethical principles say, and then somehow or another imply, or even in any way imply that the person that's making a different decision is not ethical. In fact, we've had some very active discussions within our pandemic ethics group about, we, we know that there are healthcare professionals who are actively telling their patients not to get vaccinated. Uh, we have been careful not to say that those healthcare practices are, are not ethical. Uh, we believe it's a matter of understanding why they are driven by that. If it's driven by misinformation or not understanding the information available to them, let us make an effort to educate them uh, rather than then immediately moving into a, to a situation where it's, we're making it seem like that they are unethical um, or doing something that's wrong. So I do very much appreciate those comments and they're, they're very valid and need to be heard. Well said, Dr. Foster. Uh, thank you so much. Those were points that I think we all needed to hear and remind ourselves. Let's switch to Dr. Kelly. Uh, Dr. Kelly, thank you for joining us. You're not a um, unknown with the CARE South Carolina family. And um, without very little introduction, we're gonna flip to you. And rest assured, we have plenty of time. So 
you got to fall. Well, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you much, very much for inviting me. My talk is going to be rather different from the previous three speakers because I'm not coming to you from a conceptual point of view. I just want to give you what is the latest data. And I understand the frustrations people have had about recommendations, guidance changing over time as new information comes in. Those recommendations change because we get new data. The, the whole question of do masks work? Yes or no. Do we need boosters? Yes or no. So much of that has, is guided by science where we don't know the future. We have to wait until we get the data. So I, what I hope to do this morning, oh, excuse me, this afternoon, is to give you what are the latest studies, what is the latest data so that you have the information so you can make your personal choice. Everything in life is a risk benefit ratio. So you have the facts at your fingertips so you can make your decision. I'm gonna to touch a little bit on this concept of long COVID. Uh, talk about vaccine immunity and prior infection immunity. I received a number of different questions and hopefully we can go through all the questions touching on what do we know about myocarditis, pros and cons about vaccine for children and touch on individual questions that were submitted. You know, after the big peak in the number of cases that we had in early August and through September, we have been fortunate in that we have had 10 weeks of downward trend since September 10th. This figure, that green line, shows the weak average of new cases of COVID-19 in South Carolina. 10 weeks of downward trend. But you see, I've got my little arrow pointing to a place where this past week is the first time in those in 10 weeks that we have seen an increase in the number of cases. So we're not out of the woods with this yet. We all have anticipated that we would have some increasing cases with the holidays as people get together with non-household members. Indoors, we've got uh, colder weather, so people are spending more time indoors rather than out of doors. So just with that backdrop that yes, cases were coming down, but we do have concerns that they will increase. There were some questions about what is long COVID or post COVID. So I want to touch briefly on this. It's estimated that 10 to 30% of people who have COVID-19 experience what's been nicknamed long COVID. And by that, I mean symptoms that last four or more weeks after the infection. And the symptoms can, are vague. They include fatigue, muscle aches, trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating. Uh, and it can be a mixed bag. If somebody was severely ill and in the hospital, it could be that they had organ damage. I mean, myocarditis is caused by COVID-19 disease. If somebody was severely ill, they may have some long-term consequences. But long COVID is a sneaky thing. It can occur even after a mildly symptomatic infection, and it occur, can occur in any age, including in children. There's a long list of lots of different symptoms. One of the most remarkable one, though, is this dizziness with a rapid heartbeat when you stand up. It's almost the feeling you get when you're dehydrated and you stand up too quickly, but it's not a matter of dehydration. This has something to do with it, COVID affecting your nervous system so that you don't have this normal response when you stand up. Your blood pressure drops, you get palpitations or rapid heartbeat. You may even break into a sweat or feel short of breath. This is not very well understood. There are some suggestions on the, out there on how to treat it, but it's not well understood what causes it, how COVID is producing this, these symptoms. COVID-19 is an unusual disease. And in terms of what else might be causing long COVID, it may be, as I said, organ damage from the disease or continued inflammation or an autoimmune condition. This is one of those areas where there is continued study trying to understand this disease. My bottom line communicating about COVID-19 in general is that it is very different from any other viral entity we've dealt with in the past. This is a study in a journal out of England, The Lancet, of over 1,200 people who were hospitalized with COVID-19, and they did follow up at six and at 12 months, and almost half of them still had symptoms a year after they had long COVID. And most of them were able to return to work, but they still had a lot of physical complaints. So when we talk about the risk of having COVID-19 disease, it's true. 
most people have mild to moderate illness, especially people who are younger than age 50 or people who do not have medical problems, chronic medical problems. But this is not, even though I'm going to give you some data about hospitalization and death, it's not all about that. It's also about these long-term symptoms that people can get. I mean, even mild infection can lead to long COVID with some really unusual symptoms like the change in taste or smell. Um, and it's not just a, that you don't have a taste or smell, it's that things can taste bad, even disgusting. And this is a field that's being studied right now by the ear, nose and throat doctors you know, and epidemiologists. Most people, thank goodness, recover by six months, but some people go on to have persistent symptoms. And it may be that long COVID is more common than we think. This is a summary of 29 studies from all over the world. And in this survey of all those studies, it suggested that maybe more than 40% of people have long COVID symptoms. There is very little data on treatment of long COVID. There is some data about vaccination. Certainly vaccines are 90% or more effective in preventing symptomatic disease with COVID-19. And so in that sense, it will help to prevent long COVID. There are breakthrough cases, but they're rare. And in this study, again, published out of England in The Lancet, this was a study of more than 1.2 million adults. There was 6,000 of them had breakthrough cases. That's less than 1% of those who had breakthrough cases um, uh, among people who were partially vaccinated. An even smaller number occurred among people fully vaccinated. But when they looked at people who were vaccinated and then got COVID, those people had much lower rates of long COVID. So vaccine also helps to prevent against long COVID. And it, vaccine is safe. If you are a person who has had COVID-19 and you are experiencing long COVID symptoms, it is safe to get vaccinated. The symptoms do not worsen after vaccination. And in fact, in this study, there was an improvement in symptoms for people who had long COVID and then got vaccinated. I'm just going to include a number of resources if you are experiencing long COVID or what's sometimes also nicknamed long hauler syndrome uh, and let you pursue those for on your own because I think what I want to turn to next are some of the facts to help you make a decision about whether you want to get vaccinated or not. For example, do you need COVID-19 vaccine if you've already had COVID? You know, certainly if you've already had COVID, you have some immunity, you have some natural immunity. There's still a lot of questions about how long does it last? There's still some questions about how strong is that immunity? And there's some mixed literature around that. But there are a number of studies that indicate that if you already had COVID, you can cut your risk of reinfection in half by getting vaccinated. And I've given you a couple of um, uh, journal articles here or preprint articles around that. And one of the ones that I'm quoting from is what's sometimes referred to as the Israeli study. This is a preprint. By that, I mean it has not been published in a peer-reviewed journal. It's just been uploaded. So you can find it available online, but it's not a published study yet. This was the one that showed in Israel that immunity from prior COVID was more protective against reinfection than vaccine was against first infection. And that was really remarkable. That was very different than what was being found in other studies. But of course, no one is suggesting that you should try to get infected to prevent a, a second infection. The other thing though, that I think is remarkable about this study is that something that people often don't highlight, the greatest immunity in, the, in Israel, the people who had the strongest immunity against reinfection or infection in the first place was among people who had prior COVID who then got vaccinated. People who had prior COVID but didn't get vaccinated, they were 200% more likely to get reinfected than those who got vaccinated after infection. So for folks who say, I, you know, I have natural infection, I, you know, I'm protected. Yes, I, I can't, undeniably, you have some immunity, but you can make it stronger by getting vaccinated. 
This is another study looking at prior infection versus vaccination immunity. This is done in the United States. This was just published. 187 hospitals across nine states looking at people who were hospitalized, who were uh, more than eight, age 18, who were hospitalized for COVID-like illness and tested for SARS-CoV-2. And they had them in two groups, people who had prior infection that was laboratory confirmed and people who had been vaccinated. Both groups, they either had infection or vaccination three to six months earlier. And in this study, people with prior infection were almost five and a half times more likely to get reinfected compared to those who were vaccinated. Now, I know that's the opposite of what they showed in Israel. There are a lot of different studies out there going on. Most of the studies, though, fall on this camp, that you get better protection with vaccine, and you get the best protection by, if you had COVID-19, putting a vaccine on top of it. Um, how long does immunity last? Well, we're still learning this. Now, it's studied among people with vaccines because we have, uh, you know, they were studied right from the very beginning when they're enrolled in a phase three trial. We have less um, robust information about people with prior infection. And part of the complication of that is we've had all these different variants in the United States and people getting infected more than once in different places. That's why I picked this Australian study to talk about. In Australia, right from the very beginning, they had really strict border control. They had low local transmission, but they had high testing rates. So this study was just recently put, um, placed online and it's a small number of people. But what this showed was they took 43 people who tested positive between March and April a year ago, right? 2020, so more than a year ago. And they got them in this long-term study comparing them with people who were zero negative, meaning they'd never been infected. And at one year, the people who were PCR positive, who had tested positive a year earlier, they had antibodies that showed neutralizing activity against that original version of the virus they had, but it was much less against the alpha variant and very little against the Delta variant. And the Delta variant is what's the predominant variant in the United States right now. 99% of new cases in South Carolina are the Delta variant. So there's some evidence that even though you might have circulating antibodies, they may not be as effective against the Delta variant when you got infected with a different variant more than three or six months ago. They also looked at not all about antibodies. And this study also looked at memory cells, B cells and T cell responses. And they also had a decreased response at 12 months specifically to the Delta variant. There are many, many studies out there. I'm just gonna point out that CDC has a science brief that summarizes more than 90 publications and it is a mixed bag. Some of them are talking about prior immunity, prior infection, offering stronger immunity than vaccination. A lot depends upon age. Older adults, people over age 65, they do not get as good an immune response to vaccine as younger adults. But it also has to do with other medical problems, whether you're immunocompromised. But there is clear benefit in study after study that getting vaccinated, even if you have prior infection, you will continue to benefit. I want to switch now to talking about COVID-19 disease risk and benefit versus vaccine risk and benefit. And Anne, let me check with you. I am happy to stay on past 1.30. I, I hope that that is not a hard stop. It is not a hard stop. <laughs> All right. So with apologies, I hope everyone that this is useful information to you. Um, I can always come back and do some more if we don't get to all of your questions today. This graph is called a heat map. Darker colors is a worse outcome. So for example, if you look at August and September, that's when the Delta variant was strong in the United States. This has to do with top 10 leading causes of death. And in August and September, as you can see, COVID-19 was the top number one cause of death in eight people ages 35 through 64. But for almost every age group, for almost every month in the past year, COVID-19 has been among the top 10 causes of deaths for almost every age group except for the one through four. 
Now that was nationwide. Let's move specifically to South Carolina and let's talk specifically around children. This is a slide from the South Carolina Children's Hospital Collaborative. So these are all the children's hospitals in South Carolina. They pool their data on a weekly basis. I'm going to pick a point of time when the Delta variant was predominant and we had a big surge in cases. So this is Tuesday, September 14th. The purple dots are children who are unvaccinated and older than 12 years of age who were hospitalized or in critical care or on a ventilator. The yellow dots are unvaccinated children under age 12. So 37 kids hospitalized, 19 kids in critical care, an intensive care unit, eight of them breathing on a ventilator. This is just one data point in time. Yes, it is true that children ages five through 11, children 12 through 18 um, do not get in severe disease as often as older adults, but it's not non-existent. And unfortunately, 100% of these cases were unvaccinated. This is a vaccine preventable disease. So what's the background? I'm gonna give you some nationwide statistics. We had about 2 million five through 11 year olds. I'm gonna focus on them since that's the latest vaccine that's been authorized for use. Over two, about 2 million five through 11 year olds have been infected by COVID-19. There was a sharp increase during the Delta variant. The Delta variant is a game changer. It is more contagious and causes more severe disease. More than 8,500 hospitalizations nationwide for this young age group. And it's not just kids with developmental disorders or multiple medical problems. More than 30% of those children hospitalized did not have an underlying condition. And yet one third of them ended up in the intensive care unit. Don't put a child in the ICU unless they need to be on a ventilator or some other high tech uh, medical support. There were nationwide 94 deaths from COVID-19 among five through 11. And again, lest you think 94 is not very many, it, that meant it was the eighth leading cause of death in the past year. And during Delta, the sixth leading cause of death in that age group. I know that there are other interventions, treatment options for adults. So for example, if you're an adult, whether you're, vac and you're, whether you're vaccinated or not, if you get COVID-19, you can get monoclonal antibodies to help prevent you from going into the hospital, but not for five through 11. Monoclonal antibodies are only for age 12 and above. You may have read about these new pills that are coming out, one from Merck, one from Pfizer, very effective if somebody gets COVID-19, very effective in preventing hospitalization. They're not going to be available for kids ages five through 11. They might not even be available for teens. The only prevention for COVID-19 that is available for ages five through 11 is the Pfizer vaccine. And it is 91% effective in preventing hospitalization. So let's talk about risk benefit ratios. Benefit, we already talked about, benefit of the vaccine, highly effective in preventing severe disease. What is the risk? two types of risks. One is allergic reaction. In the studies in kids ages five through 11, there were zero allergic reactions and there were zero cases of myocarditis. And that's to be expected because those are rare events. So there've been over 220 million doses of Pfizer vaccine given to adolescents and adults in the United States. From that, we can set, make some conclusions. For allergic reactions, there's been about three to five severe allergic reactions per million doses of vaccine. And the, none of those allergic reactions cause death. Any place you get vaccinated, they will have the medical personnel, the medications, the capability of treating an allergic reaction if it can occur. Let's focus more closely on myocarditis. I had an excellent discussion with Dr. Brock gosh, a couple of months ago, I think at this point about myocarditis when we really didn't know that much. And it stimulated me to look into this a lot more closely. Um, he asked questions about how, how can we know the future about myocarditis when this is a new vaccine? And I know if, if you Google myocarditis, you will see a lot of statistics about myocarditis caused by other conditions, such as from autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, or other infections like HIV or hepatitis. And that type of myocarditis can cause severe, long-lasting heart damage. 
Now, what do we know about myocarditis associated with vaccine? There was a recent study at Emory University. There are a number of other studies, but I'm going to point to this one for time's sake, just this one. And they looked at myocarditis among people who were hospitalized there in three different groups. People who have what they call classic viral myocarditis. That's the usual myocarditis. If you Google, that's what you'll read about. The multi-inflammatory syndrome of children myocarditis, that's COVID-19 disease causing myocarditis. And the people, the um, children and adolescents that they hospitalized for COVID-19 vaccine related myocarditis. In, here are their results. In green shows the number of people at discharge and at three months who were not on any medications for heart failure. So their myocarditis did not cause any permanent damage and they were not on any medication. You can see all the way on the right that 100% of the uh, adolescents who were hospitalized for vaccine-related myocarditis, 100% of them completely recovered. For the bars in the middle with the Miss C, these were adolescents who were hospitalized or children hospitalized with COVID disease. Most of them recovered completely, but two to 3% were still on heart failure medications at discharge or at three months. Classic myocarditis is a different animal. You look at those, about half of them fully recovered, but half of them did not. They were either still on medication or two to five percent of them had serious disease or even died from their myocarditis. This is not the case with the myocarditis associated with vaccine. It is a different entity. I'd remind you how serious COVID-19 disease can be in children and adolescents. So let's compare hospitalized for uh, COVID-19 and hospitalized for myocarditis. If you're hospitalized in the intensive care unit for COVID-19, it's because you need to be on a machine, often for a long hospital stay with long recovery time. If you're hospitalized and even put in the intensive care unit for myocarditis, it's so that they can do heart monitoring to look for arrhythmias, that it's not invasive. It's usually for fewer than five days. And as you saw, no one has died from myocarditis nationwide. And if most myocarditis, almost all of the cases of myocarditis have completely recovered. How can I say that based on just the Emory study? It's not just on the Emory study. This is from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, looking at almost 170 million doses of the messenger RNA vaccines. I'm just going to show you for the data for the Pfizer, because that's the one that's available for kids ages 5 through 11, but the information for Moderna is similar. As you can see where I've got it circled, about 69, you know, 69 per people per million doses of vaccine experienced myocarditis. This is specifically among males ages 16 through 17. They are at the highest risk for myocarditis. They're at higher risk for myocarditis from other causes as well, such as viruses. The risk goes down with younger age and older age. What about five through 11? Well, they didn't have any cases of myocarditis in the phase three studies, but you're not gonna see it until you have millions of doses of vaccine given. Thus far nationwide, about 2 million doses of vaccine have been given to children ages five through 11. There has not been a reported case of myocarditis yet. But let's assume, what if we assume that they get myocarditis at about the same rate as the kids 12 through 15? What would that mean? Well, I want you to visualize. Visualize, a instead of talking per million doses, let's put it in something you can visualize. Let's put it in a stadium of about 80,000 people. Let's fill that stadium, 80,000 boys, ages five through 11 years, and they're all vaccinated on average three would experience myocarditis. For girls, on average, fewer than one would experience myocarditis compared to the number of kids who end up in the hospital. So, I, you know, to my point of view, the risk-benefit ratio is clear, but I know everybody's going to make his or her own decision on this. I do want to point to the experience in Israel because they started vaccinating earlier than we did. So they started vaccinating all 
people earlier than we did, started giving boosters earlier than we did, and started giving vaccine to ages five through 11 earlier than we did. So we can look at their experience. This was their experience with myocarditis, looking at their dose one, dose two, and dose three. So for the booster dose, and interestingly, the rate of myocarditis for the third dose is actually lower than the second dose. And that may be because there was a big time span. You know, you get your booster dose six months afterwards. One of the conversations I had had with Dr. Brock, he was asking, how do you know what's going to happen, you know, five years? Maybe they completely recover from myocarditis now, but how, won't it, maybe it'll come back. Maybe they'll have long-term heart damage five, 10 years from now. Of course, I can't see into that future, but I can point to another vaccine experience, the smallpox vaccine experience. Now, smallpox may sound like ancient history, but it's not. Myocarditis was associated with other immunizations, including the smallpox vaccine. And shortly after 9-11, we were concern concerned about bioterrorism in this country. And more than 2 million US Armed Service members, mostly male, mostly young adults, were vaccinated against smallpox. They had a rate of smallpox vaccine-associated myocarditis of about 16 per 100,000. The vast majority of those were self-limited, resolved completely, did not lead to long-term cardiac dysfunction. So we have no reason to think vaccine-associated myocarditis from COVID vaccine would be any different than this smallpox vaccine. What about minor side effects? You know, the adverse events after you get vaccinated. This is from the phase three study for kids age five through 11. You can see after both doses, one and two, that about 71, 74% of them reported pain at the injection site, but about 30% of the ones in the placebo group reported pain at the injection site as well. Um, in terms of systemic adverse events, uh, fewer than 40% of them reported fatigue, fewer than 30% of them reported headache, but really they had way fewer symptoms than the vaccine given to adolescents and older adults uh, or adults. And that makes sense to me because the dose for five through 11 is just 10 micrograms. It's one third the amount that is given to adolescents and adults. I saw a lot of questions about breakthrough cases. I do wanna point out breakthrough cases really are rare and they rarely cause severe disease. This is South Carolina data. We've had over 2 million people fully vaccinated in South Carolina and about 19,000 breakthrough cases. Now, maybe we're missing some. Maybe people are having mild in breakthrough or an asymptomatic breakthrough and not getting tested. Certainly that's positive. But what is the purpose of giving someone a vaccine. The purpose of giving a vaccine is to prevent severe disease and death. And that is what vaccine is doing. So people who are hospitalized with the breakthrough cases, about 1,400 out of 2 million people vaccinated. Yes, there are people who have been vaccinated and died, fewer than 500. Almost all of these were people who were immunocompromised. The average age of people who die with a breakthrough case in South Carolina is 80. Breakthrough cases are rare. All right, quick, quick questions. What, how can we, do we distinguish? How can I tell if I get infected or I have Delta or regular COVID? Right now, 99% of new cases in South Carolina are the Delta variant. It produces the same symptoms as the original Wuhan strain of COVID. What's different though, is if you got infected with the original strain, you might not have the same strength of immunity against the Delta variant. Whereas the vaccine has been demonstrated to be effective against the Delta variant. Are you considered fully vaccinated? No booster. Yes. So if you got two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or a single dose of Janssen, you are fully vaccinated. But still highly recommended if you're 50 or older, or if you just had a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, it's highly recommended that you get a booster because your, your immunity is not as strong. 
What about the situation where we all have experienced it? This person wrote, I got COVID, but my boyfriend didn't. I'm vaccinated. He isn't. Well, life is unfair. It's true. There are going to be some breakthrough cases, and there are going to be some people who are not vaccinated who don't get COVID-19. People's innate immunity varies. What about waning immunity? Are we going to need constant boosters? Probably not. Remember, lots of vaccines need boosters. Hepatitis B, you get three doses, you need a booster. All those pediatric vaccines, DTaP, tetanus boosters that we get every 10 years. Boosters, needing boosters is not a sign that a vaccine doesn't work. It's a sign that you, your immune system needs a rem reminder. So will we need constant boosters? Probably not. Will we need boosters once a year like we do the flu shot? Maybe if new variants emerge, but we're not going to need we're most likely not going to need constant boosters. There was a question about vaccination and mammograms. If you get vaccinated, the vaccine goes into your arm, stimulates your immune system, which means it also stimulates all your lymph nodes, which means it can cause some swelling in the lymph nodes in your armpit. And if you're a woman and you get a mammogram, they're gonna look at that swollen gland in your armpit and say, uh-oh, is this something important? Is this from the vaccine or is this a possible cancer and we need to do some further tests? So it is recommended that if you're just going for your routine mammogram, get it before you're vaccinated. Or if you get vaccinated, wait six weeks after your second dose to get your mammogram, just so you don't get a false positive. That's, I'm gonna finish about vaccines and fertility and pregnancy. The data are clear. We've had more than a million women in this country who have been pregnant and vaccinated, and that vaccine is safe in pregnancy. In study after study, however, pregnancy and COVID-19 disease are a bad combination. People, Women who are pregnant with, and get COVID-19 because they are not vaccinated, they are twice as likely to have a stillbirth they are more than twice as likely to have a miscarriage. They're almost five times as likely to end up in the intensive care unit. We, there have been multiple studies demonstrating that the vaccine itself does not interfere with fertility. In fact, well, I just read one recently about unintended pregnancies were just as common in women who were vaccinated as in women who were not vaccinated. There is no evidence that vaccine affects fertility, no evidence that it adversely affects pregnancy, but lots of evidence that pregnancy and COVID is a bad combination. I would strongly urge you, if you are pregnant or trying to get pregnant, to get vaccinated. I apologize for taking extra time. I hope that was worth it to you. I see there are questions in the chat. You are always welcome if we don't answer your question today to email me directly. My email address is Kelly JM the number one at dhec.sc.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, there were a few questions, and I probably will copy those and uh, actually send them to you. We are going to be opening up our offices back at two o'clock, and we don't want to delay our patients uh, from coming in, so we will probably do that. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> guess what time it is right now, though? This is our drawing for our $3,000. So <laughs> we don't want to keep people away from their $3,000. Um, and Amanda Edelman is going to do this for us. So Amanda, hey guys. take it away. <laughs> hey guys, how are y'all? Been a fun 10 days. We'll announce a $3,000 winner. So my checking account is going to be very happy. The winner is Carrie Allison at the pharmacy in Chesterfield. Congratulations, Carrie. Get in touch with me so I can give you your moolah. Oh, that is amazing. And that pharmacy in Chesterfield is gonna have a grand opening. Uh, it is actually gonna be open on December the 1st. So, oh, congratulations. All right. Well, folks, I think we've done a good job here. There's a lot coming in, but there's some great co congratulations. And um, I really appreciate everyone's attention. We had great panelists today. So let's go on about our day. And uh, like I said, we'll take a copy of this chat 
and unanswered questions, we'll get them answered for you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Ann. Appreciate Thank the y'all. opportunity. Thank you. Thanks again to everybody else. Yes, y'all are doing wonderful work. I'm so proud of all of you. Anything I can do to help, just let me know. Thank you. you you've been a very big help. All right, y'all all take right. care. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving to all. Yes, indeed. Be kind, be gentle, and be grateful. Ms. Ann, can we all stay on? She leave over. left already. She may have. I'm, I'm still on. I mean, I'm need still anything on. Else? I'm, yeah. yeah. You know, Jane, one of the things I, I, I thought about, I didn't get